We've all heard stories of private property, in effect, being condemned so that some woodland creature we've never heard of could live there. Of course, that's usually with no consideration for the rights of the landowner. Well, a case is hopefully coming before the U.S. Supreme Court that's more ridiculous than that. Welcome to Wait Till You Hear This. I'm Steve Eastman. Today, we have Pacific Legal Foundation attorney Mark Miller with us to tell us about the case. Mark, thanks for visiting with us today. Thank you for having me on, Steve. This case is officially known as Markle v. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and involves 1,500 acres of private land in Louisiana. But the protected creature in this controversy, the dusky gopher frog, would not benefit in any way. Can you explain this for us, Mark? It involves a frog that is not in the state of Louisiana. It's called the dusky gopher frog. That frog only exists in Mississippi, more than 50-plus miles away from where my client at Point Event and his family businesses, Markle businesses, where they exist. And what the government has said is, we want to protect this frog, and so we are going to deem not only the area where it lives in Mississippi to be critical habitat for the frog that puts rules and regulations on how you use that property, but we're also going to declare that some property, my client's property, in Louisiana. Louisiana is critical habitat. So even though the frog doesn't live there, hasn't lived there in decades, could not exist there even if the frog was put in a bus and driven there because the conditions of the environment would not uh, sustain the frog. It couldn't live there with the kind of conditions that are there now. Nevertheless, the federal government, the Fish and Wildlife Service, has decided to deem that land critical habitat and basically put our clients in a position where they could never do anything but what's going on right now uh, without getting permission from the federal government. So um, how many judges have apparently ignored common sense so far? First you have the the regulators, the bureaucrats at the Fish and Wildlife Service who decide, yes, they're going to protect land for a frog that doesn't live there and, and couldn't live there. Then the case gets challenged in the federal trial court there in, in New Orleans, and the district judge says, even though I don't think this makes sense effectively, I'm not quoting him, but basically he says, even though I don't think this makes sense, I don't think I have a choice. The federal government does have the authority under the Endangered Species Act to do what it's doing. So we then take an appeal to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. The first ruling is a two-to-one decision. Two judges say, this is understandable. Perhaps one day this land could be used for the frog, and the frog is endangered. And so Congress has authority to create a law that can then allow these bureaucrats to control our client's land, even though the frog's not there. The one judge who dissents explains that this is outrageous, and if the federal government can do this, then they could do it to anyone, anywhere. Why couldn't they decide that the land in California is critical habitat for this frog? Because if you change the land and create the conditions that the frog could need, then perhaps the frog could live in California, too. That's really what they've said as to our client's land. Even though it couldn't live there, the conditions wouldn't allow it. It hasn't been there in 50 years plus. doesn't matter. So the dissenter says that's outrageous. We then ask the whole court to hear the case. So not just the three judges. Normally in federal court, you have a three-judge panel that hears your case on appeal. But we ask all the judges. And there, again, common sense does not prevail. We have uh, a close uh, vote not to hear the case as the whole court. If I recall correctly, five justice judges say they should have heard it, but the majority of the courts, I think it was seven, might have been eight, say, nope, we're not going to rehear this case. The dissenters say, you know, this frog is known to be shy, and he's particularly shy in the sense that he's never been to Louisiana, the shy frog. And yet we're signing off on the federal government having the power to deem land critical habitat for a creature that doesn't even live in the area where this critical habitat supposedly is. Well, let's uh, get back to the landowners. It sounds like uh, they're the real victims, not the frog. What kind of financial risk do they face if they cannot develop the land? The federal government admits it would be as much as a $34 million impact on their land by declaring it critical habitat. That's unbelievable. Mark, when anything is this odd, you have to wonder if there's an ulterior motive I know you can't read uh, the bureaucrats' minds, but just for the fun of it, what are some of the possibilities? You have fish 
Fish and Wildlife Service employees who may mean well. They get into this line of work because they want to, you know, at least in part, protect endangered species. So they mean well, but then they push the limits of how much power they have. And so here, our founding fathers said that Congress could only regulate interstate commerce, interstate meaning commerce between the states, and we would argue here where the frog is intrastate in Mississippi, frankly, they can't go so far as to deem land in Louisiana critical habitat for the frog. Well, let me say uh, you've been more than charitable to your legal opponents about their motives. Very possible to get into some uh, less charitable interpretations of it, too. Certainly someone more cynical than me. <laughs> of discussion or more cynical than I'm willing to be on the record, might suggest that this is an example of Fish and Wildlife simply wanting to protect environment and doing whatever it can to, and not just protect environment, but to shut down any sort of commercial interest. So this land is being used for timber harvesting, and so I could see someone perhaps more skeptical than me of, of our federal government's beneficent motives just saying that, in fact, this is an example of Department of Interior, Fish and Wildlife Service, simply wanting to shut down any sort of commercial enterprise. I've got cases all over the nation, got a case in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, where it's quite clear the um, EPA wants to shut down mining industry. And so how they do that, they don't give road permits for local governments that want roads, highways. Similarly here, someone might argue that Fish and Wildlife is simply trying to shut down the commercial timber industry in Louisiana. I'd like to ask you about What do you think are the chances that the case will actually come before the Supreme Court? Many times the justices turn down more cases than they allow to proceed because of lack of time or whatever. What do you think the chances are that it will actually go before the Supreme Court? And there's a couple of reasons why. Number one, it is a case that pushes the outer limits of the federal government's authority under the Endangered Species Act, and the justices have signaled that they are willing to look at cases like this. Number two, it involves administrative law and what kind of decisions of the executive agencies here, the Interior, Endangered Species, uh, Fish and Wildlife Department, what kind of decisions they can make that are immune from judicial review. And Pacific Legal Foundation, uh, we're a nonprofit and we represent property owners before the Supreme Court, and we've had some success in convincing the Supreme Court of the United States that they should rule that the courts can hear decisions by administrative agencies, whether it be the Army Corps of Engineers, the EPA, or in this case, Fish and Wildlife, where the agencies like to say, no, the courts can't even tell us what to do. Well, Mark, uh, you seem very passionate about this case, and I'd like to thank you for educating our listeners today. Stephen, thank you very much. I would encourage your listeners, if they want to learn more, to go to my law firm's website, pacificlegal.org. We are a 501c3. We represent uh, here at Point Event, our client and his business, Marco, interests uh, at no charge. We represent all our clients at no charge. People donate money to us to represent uh, property owners who are in fights with the government. You know, they say you can't fight City Hall, but Pacific Legal fights City Hall on behalf of individuals, and we often win. So if you like that idea, check out our website and read more about our cases. Mark Miller is a senior attorney with Pacific Legal Foundation, which specializes in cases where liberty is under attack. The website to check out is pacificlegal.org. I'm Steve Eastman for Wait Till You Hear This. Discover more stories like this one on our website, waittillyouhearthis.com. you hear this.com.